Okay, I think we'll get started now. We've got over 100 and nearly 20 people in this call, which is fantastic. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'm delighted to see so many people with us. Um, I've got my colleague Cheryl, who is supporting today's webinar, and also Jess from Engage. Uh, a few housekeeping notes I'm going to run through um, just before we start the webinar. So, hold on, if everyone could please keep their cameras off for the session and stay muted, as I said, so we can focus on Jess and her presentation. If you've got any questions, please put them in the chat box. We'll try and address as many of these as we can during the Q&A part of today's session. But if we can't get to all of them, we'll address some in a follow up email next week. Please note that today's session is recorded. The recording and the slides from today will be shared next week as well. If you can't hear, um, please remember to turn up your um, volume and also you can use the closed caption option, which is available to some people with the Zoom toolbar. We'll be having a feedback form. Please remember to fill this in at the end of the session. We'll drop the link in the chat and there'll also be a QR code. Uh, finally, please remember to be respectful of everyone during this session. This is an open session for all, and so we want to treat everyone with respect. Uh, without further ado, I'd love to hand over to Jess, who's joining us from Reengage and is the Head of Impact. So over to you, Jess. Thanks so much, Ruby, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Ruby said, I'm Jess Doyle, and I'm the Head of Impact at an organisation called Reengage. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you this afternoon to be sharing the findings from our research, recent research project regarding the impact of scams on fraud on isolated older people. Before I get into the findings um, and, and kind of sharing our findings with you, I thought it'd be really useful to just provide a bit of a broad overview about who we engage are and what we do. Next slide, please, Ruby. Thank you. So who are we and what do we do? So Reengage is an organisation that operates nationwide and we support people over the age of 75 who are living alone and may be experiencing social isolation and loneliness. We know from the 2021 census that there were an estimated 1.8 million people over the age of 75 living alone in England and Wales. And we also know from recent reports regarding an ageing population that this figure is likely to be significantly higher now in 2024. So what do we actually do? We support between 6,000 and 8,000 old people per year um, in a variety of ways, in a variety of loneliness interventions. And we are a volunteer-led organisation and we have a fantastic community of over 9,000 volunteers with roles ranging from hosting monthly tea parties to a telephone befriending service. We work with what is often you, the terminology used as the oldest old, so those aged 75 and over, to provide social interaction and bring an end to loneliness and isolation. Our vision is very simple. It's to have a world where no one is ever too old to make friends or enjoy social interaction. And our mission is to work within communities to end social isolation and loneliness that many old people experience. Next slide, please, Ruby. So how do we do it? We do it in, in a variety of ways. Reengage has been operating for 59 years um, and we turn 60 next year. Our historical model um, was our, is our tea party model and this is volunteer led and operates in a very simple function. Our volunteer, our tea party hosts, will host a tea party for older people within their community, at, within their homes. And a volunteer driver will collect our older people and take them to the volunteers home where they will enjoy two hours of conversation, connection and sometimes cake. We also run activity groups um, and these are generally centred around gentle exercise groups, but they are based on the skill set of our volunteers and the interests of our older people. So our activity groups have been known to diversify and include things such as reading groups or book clubs. When the pandemic hit in 2020, as many of us know, unfortunately, we were forced to, 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 we were forced to suspend our face-to-face -face services. And 
that obviously had a devastating impact on our older people. And we know that the theme of social isolation and loneliness was topical during the pandemic. So in response to the pandemic, we introduced something called our core companion service, which was a telephone befriending service. We have two tranches of our core companion service. We have our rainbow core companions, which is centered on our LGBT plus members. And we also have a Parkinson service, which is available for people who um, are have been diagnosed with Parkinson's. We also have a Crosby uh, service, and this is in Crosby only because this is a service we inherited over the last two years. And in Crosby, we run a lunch club and a cinema club. And these are very well attended services, which we hope to be rolling out in the near future. Absolutely. Next slide, please, Ruby. Bye, boys. So you may be wondering, as if we were a loneliness charity, why did we decide to conduct research in regards to scams and fraud? Um, and our answer is very simple. Next slide, please, Ruby. Three years ago, we embarked on a journey to understand our older people, our older beneficiaries' use of the internet and how they connect with others. And what we found within that preliminary research was there was a culture of fear, loneliness and isolation, which was related to scams, fraud and vulnerability to these crimes. Many of our older people told us that they weren't using the Internet or they weren't going online because they were worried they were going to become a victim of fraud or they were going to be scammed and lose significant amounts of money. We were really concerned about this kind of this theme within this preliminary research, but equally we wanted to do something about it. If this was an, an area that was causing issues and exacerbating social isolation and loneliness, then it's something we also needed to address and tackle. So we partnered with the University of Portsmouth and we spoke to 1,177 older people as part of our research. And we started to unpick kind of findings and themes related to the kind of the details around scams and fraud and how this impacted the quality of life of our older people but also resulted in that end of social isolation and loneliness theme. We conducted our research and we published a report and I will come on to share our findings in a minute but also our kind of next steps and actions but what really came from this research and this report was that not enough really is being done to address uh, social isolation and loneliness and it's linked to scams and fraud. Next slide please Ruby. So our preliminary findings were this, we found that 80% of those that took part in our research were living alone, 50% had never used the internet and this wasn't just in the kind of the six or 12 months prior to us interviewing them, this was at all, they'd never logged on and they'd never been online. 70% had never banked online and 42% were not confident spotting a web-based scam. And this also included things such as phishing emails and those pop-up things that may seem a bit dubious when we perhaps click onto a website or perhaps a scam web page. Next slide please, Ruby. So what were our findings from the research? So we found in generalisation that fear of scams and fraud was a widespread reason why older people avoided using the internet. Many told us that it was much easier to alleviate the risk and not be at risk at all just by simply not logging on and not connecting in that way. We also found that high profile meeting reporting on internet fraud and malpractice in specific areas exacerbated fears, even if an older person had not been a victim of a crime. Hearing about it continually in media and on the news and reading about it in newspapers exacerbated the fear that they were going to become a victim of crime. And therefore, this also prevented them from logging on, using the Internet and connecting with others. These fears deterred older people from embracing social media. As we know, social media and the Internet has many pitfalls, but it also provides in some ways lots of social connection and ability to connect with others, very much like we are all today. We are all connecting here on, the web, on this webinar and we're using the Internet. And many of our older people are kind of excluded from sessions like this due to this fear of scams and fraud and just logging online in its entirety. And we found that older people who do use the internet, so when we did interview, there were some people who did say they are using the internet, 
they did remain vulnerable to the emotionally and financially devastating impact of online scams. Those that we spoke to when we pulled out many case studies had been the victim of scams. They had not been able to recognise phishing emails. They had paid money for things that did not exist. Um, and so there was this real lack of knowledge amongst our older people who were using the internet and lack of awareness. Next slide, please, Ruby. We also found that a large number of our older adults who um, indicated also also kind of told us that they hadn't received any useful advice. And this we found very surprising. So at the point of interview, um, six months prior to us interviewing, many of our old people had said they had not received any advice regarding scams or fraud in the prior six months. And even more surprisingly, 27% said they had not received any useful advice regarding scams or fraud at all. We also discovered that 39% were using the same password for multiple accounts and just under half kept written lists of passwords at home. And this obviously made them much more vulnerable to hackers using the same password as we know across multiple platforms puts us at greater risk because once one password is hacked, it's very easy and much easier for hackers to then access multiple platforms and all of our personal information, even to the extent of our banking information. Of the 30% um, did indicate that they use password managers, but only 15% use two-factor authentication for their main accounts. And a, a very significant finding for us from this research was the sheer number of attempted frauds that our older people had experienced. So at least two thirds had experienced at least one attempt in the last six months of being scammed or a victim of fraud. However, around a fifth experienced at least one attempt either weekly or more frequently. And around a third to 40% had experienced attempts on a monthly basis. There was also a really shocking statistic where some of our older people, so three to 4% of them, had experienced attempts of um, fraudulent activity or being scammed on a daily basis. So scammers were contacting our older people very frequently, um, trying to get them to sign up to things, part with money, um, invest in certain stocks and so forth. And this obviously created some devastating impacts. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to share with you a quote from one of our participants, which really highlights the impact that being a victim of scams and fraud can have. I went online to find the address and number of my local Citizens Advice Bureau. I found what seemed to be what I was looking for and in return for £1,000 paid by card received advice. I subsequently noticed a debit of £5,000 from my account. My bank helped to get the money back and blocked the payee. I have now learnt my lesson and passed the warning to friends and family. Now this was a respondent who had gone online and they were seeking some advice. We're all very familiar with Citizens Advice Bureau. We know the kind of um, advice they give and, and this is what they were looking for. And unfortunately, a fraudulent website had been created and the respondent believed that in order to access the advice, they had to pay the money. And that then obviously led into the consequences of the, them losing even more money through the, the, the fraud and scam. But this didn't just impact and had a financial um, impact on, on the respondent. It also impacted quality of life. Their, their confidence and trust in others diminished. They, they told us about feeling angry, but also upset. And this also led to depression. And these stories were very um, common within our research. We had many stories. We had one account of a gentleman who was um, a victim of fraud and, and lost his entire life savings. One gentleman was uh, scammed out of £80,000 and is still in the process of trying to recover it. So there are, there are many different ways. And when we also were looking in our research, this wasn't just looking at online frauds and scams. This was also scams and fraud over the telephone. And in some extreme cases, people knocking on doors, so called call calling. And are older people not having the confidence or not remembering necessarily to ask to see an ID or verify their ID and giving very personal information to someone who stood at the door who was just there with a clipboard pretending to be from a specific organisation. Next slide, please. So what is the link to well-being and loneliness? 
So 28% of people who had been a victim of crime in the prior five years to our interview had experienced a high impact on their quality of life. But 14% who had not been a victim had also experienced an impact to quality of life. And this was due purely to the fear of becoming a victim. We find that 25% of our older people felt unsafe when answering the phone and a third felt unsafe using the internet or buying things online or banking online. Many of the impacts that were associated with fraud victimisation were also noted among participants who had not been victims and we heard words such as financial anger, stress, upset, anxiety, depression and in some cases feelings of suicide and some respondents noted changes in their behaviour. And what really stood out to us within this research was that these, some of these words, stress, upset, anxiety, depression, are very common when we talk about well-being and loneliness with our older beneficiaries. And when we when we ask them to tell us how they're feeling, we often hear words like I'm feeling upset, I'm feeling lonely, I'm feeling anxious, I feel, feel like I can leave the house. And this then not creates the sense of depression, which then creates this kind of revolving door. We also found that the impact of fraud and scams um, was really significant and that you did not need to be a victim of a fraud. You did not need to be a victim of fraud or a scam to be impacted. And we find that just even using the word scam in our research generated this sense of fear, but also a lot of negativity. And through the course of our study, it was very difficult for us to connect and actually engage people in this research and our study, because as soon as we mentioned the word scam, they automatically um, had a, a sense of distrust in us, even though they were a member of our community. Mm -hmm. And that was, again, a really kind of loud and clear message that came through from our research. Next slide, please. So what are our, what were our recommendations and what are our recommendations? So firstly, we feel like there needs to be a promotion of scams and fraud awareness. If we go back to that statistic where in six months, in the last six months, all our older people hadn't had any useful advice or um, conversations regarding scams or fraud, and in some cases had never not had any toolkits or resources ever, there needs to come, people need to start having conversations about scams and fraud. And although we know in some cases they do generate fear, it's important that we keep having them, but we have them in constructive and positive ways. And we talk about the things that we can do to prevent ourselves becoming victims of scams and fraud. We also strongly believe that the government should invest money in funding high quality call blockers. Some of the respondents of our surveys had these in place and therefore were less, less at risk. And they are a very effective way of preventing our older people becoming victims of scams and fraud. Our kind of messaging to researchers who are conducting research with older people that are, that is related to crime, but also those who are living on their own, should re, that should be that they should restrict the use of telephone as a means of communication and find alternative means. If you're cold, cold calling someone as a researcher, which is often the case, it's very difficult to build a sense of trust and community um, with that older person. And often when we conduct research, we're asking somebody, that the participant, to give us very personal information. We also recommend training for volunteers um, throughout organisations, upskilling our volunteers to be able to recognise if somebody they're supporting has been a victim of scam or fraud, but also giving them the tools and resources to share to prevent scams and fraud is really key. But this also rolls on to professionals, and we feel like professionals that are coming into contact with the over 75s on a daily basis, and this is typically healthcare professionals, should also be equipped with the tools and the resources to be able to support not only victims of scams and fraud, but people who may be at risk. And we feel greater attention and support should be directed at older people who are more likely to be vulnerable. And within our study, these categories were people living alone with poor social networks people who were suffering health problems, whether that be physical or mental health, prior victims of fraud or crime, or people who, or people whose partner have recently died. And we really feel that the attention should include a risk assessment, but also advice and potential measures to reduce the risk of fraud to help people prepare um, and know what to look out for. Next slide, please. So what action are we taking and what action have we taken? 
So between March 22 and November 23, we developed a bespoke online training for our volunteers. We developed a suite of resources, a bespoke online uh, kind of training platform module, and we rolled that out to our community of 9,000 volunteers. And we encouraged them to take complete the module, take part in the training, and really equip themselves with the skills and knowledge. We encouraged our Tea Party volunteers to look out for any signs that perhaps one of their Tea Party guests had been a victim of scam or fraud, or that they were potentially at risk. Perhaps they had mentioned that they'd started using the internet um, more recently. And we encouraged them to have conversations around safe internet use um, and how to connect safely. We also promoted the National Trading Standards Scheme and we worked with the Friends Against Scams team, promoted the Scams Marshals and Scams Champion roles that the National Trading Standards Scheme run. And some of our volunteers, as a result of our webinar, actually signed up to become Scam Marshals and Scam Champions, which was a really positive result. We developed a dedicated web page with the Friends Against Scams team. So there was a dedicated resource in which we could signpost our volunteers, but also older people who were starting to use the Internet, too. And we shared information about scams and fraud and we promoted the training with our, within our volunteer e -new, monthly e-newsletter. And for our older people, we shared the findings from our research and tips to protect against and avoid scams and fraud with our, via our Time Together magazine, which is received by our members three times a year. But our work doesn't stop there. This is an ongoing issue. And so we published our report in November and we delivered a webinar to key stakeholders, including local authority officials and government officials, about the impact of scams and fraud and how this links to social isolation and loneliness for the older population. We've also been rolling out a pilot digital skills project. And within the digital skills project, we've been encouraging our volunteers to work on a one on one basis with our older people who have expressed an interest in using the Internet for things such as connecting with family members, online banking or online shopping. And we started to see some really positive results in this respect. Some of our older beneficiaries have started to use tablets or computers. Um, some have connected with family they haven't spoken to in months because they live further afield or abroad. And some of our uh, Tea Party guests have actually started to use FaceTime to connect with each other outside of the sessions. And this has been something that has been generated um, and supported by volunteers. And most recently, one of our guests has just completed her first online grocery shop and was delighted when the groceries arrived at her door and, the, and really recognised the simplicity of the process, but also felt equipped because she had the support of the volunteer Tea Party. We'll continue to raise awareness about scams and fraud and the link between loneliness and social isolation in events such as this. We continue to spread the message and promote our report. And if you'd like to access the report, you can find it on our website. And I'd be more than happy to, for Ruby to share a link to our report after, um, after this session. Next slide, please, Ruby. So that was very much uh, kind of centred on our scams and fraud project. Um, but I also wanted to share with you um, some a small, smaller study we did in spring last year. So typically, um, as the impact team, we will ask our older beneficiaries to tell us about topics of interest to them or kind of areas that we are keen to research. Um, and in this instance, we asked our older beneficiaries to tell us about their experiences of civic participation. Now, we didn't keep this um, kind of specifically focused. We kept this very generalised. We wanted to know anything from climate crisis to, um, as we see here, fears of crime and unsafe areas. And actually, fears of crime and unsafe areas was not a topic we um, kind of put to them, but was something that came back um, quite strongly within the feedback we received. Next slide, please. And when we asked our older, uh, older beneficiaries about civic participation, 91% said they had a significant fear of crime um, within their area and, and feeling very unsafe within their area. 40% said they, had, they were worried about knife crime. 17% advised us they were concerned about antisocial behaviour within their local community. And 16% said they felt very unsafe. And within this kind of very short survey, we discovered that a lot of these re these issues around feeling unsafe in the area, fears of antisocial behaviour and knife crime, really kind of um, 
led to these exacerbated feelings of social isolation and loneliness. Some respondents told us they, they didn't want to leave their home. It stopped them connecting with their community or um, engaging in local neighbourhood activities because they felt very vulnerable in their area. Um, again, they didn't feel safe. And this kind of synergizes with our fraud and scams project um, in, in different ways. And we can see really that the feeling of crime and feeling unsafe in relation to scams and fraud, but also within local areas, creates this and generates this sense of social isolation and loneliness. Next slide, please. And again, I just wanted to share two of the point, kind of poignant quotes we had from the survey. And this was from one gentleman who told us, I don't feel safe out at night, and I despair at the general state of the high street and neighbourhood. And someone else said, the increase in the number of stabbings that take place among young lads with no reason to be carrying a knife only to do harm. It is really frightening as well as very sad. And we received many quotes and comments like this about the fear of stabbings, the fear of unsafety and the feeling of not wanting to leave the home. Now, this was just a very short project we did, um, and we are planning to delve deeper into, into these kind of themes of crime and unsafe areas, but also looking more in depth at the built environment and the actions we can take to reduce some of these risks. And we are kind of exploring these subjects in the coming months and years through various research projects. Next slide, please. So I would just like to thank you all for listening to me today. I hope you find um, our research um, insightful and interesting. Um, if you would, if any of the things I've said today, particularly around loneliness and social isolation have resonated with you in any way, um, and you are over the age of 75, you can of course contact us. You can refer yourself to our services. If we just skip to the next slide, um, we'll, you can see our contact details there. You can go onto our website and you can refer yourself and you can access our um, activity groups, our tea parties or call companions. Equally, if you don't fit within that age group, but you are the, someone has sprung to mind who may you think may be experiencing social isolation or loneliness, you can also complete a referral form on our website or you can contact us via that number. And we are always looking for volunteers. So if what we do sounds good to you, then please do reach out or complete our volunteer application form and a member of our service delivery team will be in touch. And if you're interested in the research I've shared today, or you'd like to learn more, or you'd like to speak to me further about it and connect offline, I've just added my email address there. So please feel free to jot that down and reach out to me if you would like to uh, connect further. And uh, I can happy to take any questions. So, yes, thank you so much. That's so interesting. And you managed to pack so much interesting data and findings into that. I really appreciate it. Um, and I can see I've been following along in the chat and I can see so many people have really interesting questions, really interesting insights into your work. Um, and also it feels like a lot of people have actually experienced what you've been talking about. There's quite a lot of people here who have felt isolated or unsafe in their area. Um, so I have a feeling that this has been a really good session for people. So thank you very much. Um, I just wanted I've, I've got there's been a few questions in the chat that I thought I could read out to you and also some that have come to my mind as well. Um, so one of the questions someone said, and I think you've just said it, but to remind us, what age um, do re-engage work with? The ser how old do you have to be to access the services? But also for people who might be younger or not young enough, but still feel isolated or a bit unsafe, what can they do? So our age range is 75. So we support over 75 and over. Um, and that's that's people who can access our services. And that's our, what we class as our older person, our older person beneficiaries. Yeah. If you're um, younger than 75, you can still actually benefit from our services by becoming a volunteer, yeah. um, either via a call companion or um, hosting a tea party, being involved in a tea party or an activity group because many of our volunteers are actually within the 50 to 60 age bracket um, and they really benefit from the feelings of one, giving something back and supporting older people in their community, but also they do give us that they do tell us there is this sense of you know reduction in their own social isolation and loneliness that they might be experiencing. If yeah. you're not keen on volunteering but you are um, you know seeking support, there are other organizations and there are partners such as Age UK, that you can also um, reach out to. There are organisations like Samaritans if you're having a particularly tough time. So we do encourage you to to kind of connect with them as well. 
Um, typically, our age demographic, I should have mentioned this in the presentations, um, is our average age is 85. Um, 85 to 90. So it is an older age demographic, but we do um, work with older volunteers um, and we support um, the oldest old as the terminology goes. Yeah, no, thank you. I think it's really good for people to know that they can benefit so much from being involved in volunteering or other services as much as actually receiving those services as well if they were a bit older. Um, and I think I can see in the chat people are saying it's Age UK, they've worked with them or, you know, they really appreciate that sort of um, that joint approach. Um, so that's brilliant. Um, another question. So some of the things that um, you touched on someone asked how do we strike a balance between digitally connecting older people and really encouraging those positive you know aspects with preparing for you know spotting scams and avoiding it how do we strike that balance do you think I think a key thing is one of the things we have definitely learned from the digital skills project is that there is a no one size fits all approach mm. but equally anything in, in of that nature in terms of um, helping older people recognize when they're at risk of scams but it also connect online is a slow burning process it's mm. not something that can be expedited in three to six months it you know if organizations are undertaking projects where they're going to provide training or resources it really needs to be understood that that has to be a minimum of 12 months just to kind of get people at a stage where they feel yeah, OK, I might be interested in, in kind of connecting and getting online. It's not like a priority for many of our older people. And that's something that really came through from our digital skills project. Mm. Striking the balance, I think, again, it is that one is that kind of there's not one prescription uh, for everybody, but it's equipping ourselves um, uh, with the knowledge on how to recognise scams and fraud is yeah. equipping our volunteers, um, members in our community but I think there's also that balance of showing the positivity that being online and online connections can bring and that balance and, and just making feel people confident that when they do, you know, sign on to the Internet, when they do perhaps set up a social media page, whatever they, they you know, they want to do online banking, they're not going to be definitely at risk um, and they're not going to automatically become a victim. There are things in place. And I, I, we probably many of you have probably noticed in recent months, the government have rolled out a huge fraud and scams campaign. We see it, there's a big TV campaign at the moment um, focused on fraud and scams and recognising that. So there's lots of work going on, I think, at a national level as well. And banks are definitely getting better um at kind of re recognizing um when fraudulent activity is has taken place but also being really very responsive to that and i think we have to give that kind of recognition you know to them as well um but yeah i think that balance is that kind of positivity but also equipping people with the skills and the knowledge they need no, that, that's really good. I think you're right. And also you touched on it earlier. Sessions like this, so we're spreading the word and we're both raising awareness of re-engages work and of scams, but also about, you know, showing how people can access support, the things to look out for. And that general awareness rate, I think, is so important. Um, we had some questions about, well, a, a few questions. One about, um, can you, how do you report to banks that money's been stolen? And some people feel that their bank, in their experience, banks haven't been responsive. And I suppose that is a bit case by case. Um, so that's one question about banks and losing money through scams. But there's also a question around, um, can you report cold callers and scammers to the police? Say, you know, you said about people coming to the door. What, how do you report them? What can you do about that? So to answer the first question, um, your bank should have a fraud team. Um, there should be a number um, and you should be able to call it, go straight through if you think you've been a victim of a scam or fraud. Um, and they, there should be someone who kind of dedicated, assigned to your case to help you. Um, and you can also contact Trading Standards about that as well if you're not getting a response from your bank. Um, and in, in regards to call call callers, yes, you absolutely can report call callers to the police. Um, but you can also report them to trading standards as well. Um, and that is the Friends Against Scams and the Scam Champions. That's very much what they're set up to do and their program is set up to do. Um, and yes, if, if you feel you've been at risk, I think trading standards is probably the first port of call and then reporting to the police. But the, the Friends Against Scams team are extremely helpful, extremely friendly, and they're able to provide step by step guidance kind of on what to do and, and how to kind of access support if you've been the victim of uh, a scam or fraud. Brilliant. Thank you. That's really straightforward. 
Um, and it's good to know that you can report those cold callers at your door to those services as well. Because I can imagine, for I mean, I've, my parents have experienced it. It's quite affronting. It can be a little bit scary to experience that. So it's good to know absolutely. something can be done. Yeah, absolutely. It, it can be really, um, it can be really quite frightening, I think, for some of our older people. I think when someone turns up at your door, particularly post-pandemic as well, when we're not used to seeing people in that way, you know, and someone kind of turns up at your door and they must sometimes they're in suit. Um, yeah. And sometimes, and you know, we know scammers are getting much better at having, you know, ID badges, um, fake ID badges, and all those things. And it's difficult, you know, even if you ask to see an ID badge, how do you identify that? Mm-hmm. And again, friends against scams and the scam champions, they have all these tools and resources to be able to help you to ask the right questions, know what information to ask if someone does, um, you know, turn up at your door. But equally, I think also just having the confidence to say, I'm, I'm not going to give you my information, you know, e- you know, even if they generally are, say, from um, an energy company or, or whatever, it's not it's not beyond reasonable to say, I'm not comfortable talking to you. I'm not comfortable giving you my information, but I will call your organisation and, you know, and I can have a conversation and then you can call, you know, a number that, you know, is genuine. Um, and that's a very, very similar advice, really. So if you receive a text or a call from, say, your bank, it's very difficult for you to ascertain if that genuinely is your bank that is contacting you. Mm. And the general recommended advice is um, if you receive a call, end the call and say, thank you, um, I will call you back and then call your bank back because that is how you know you're getting through to your bank and you're not speaking to someone who is trying trying to scan you and you we probably I expect many people have seen you know the tv campaigns um and such forth but we know scammers they sometimes will have access to details or they'll be they're very clever and manipulative getting that information from you and they'll say well we just need you to log on and, and you know and that's when they'll go and they'll kind of put um you know software and bugs on computers or mm. on smartphones or anything you're using so if you have any doubts it's ending that call straight away and then calling your bank or whichever organisation they're pretending to be from um, and just saying, I've just had a call. And nine times out of ten, your bank will say, yeah, that absolutely wasn't us. Um, and that was a scammer. Mm. Thank you, Jess. That's really good to know. And you're so right. Ending that call to giving yourself also a little bit of time to process what you've heard and then deciding, OK, now I'm going to ring them back. Because if you're put on the spot, I can imagine that's what scammers are relying on sometimes as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had a question, um, and it's a little bit different, but I think you touched on it, so you might be able to offer help. We mentioned about um, not writing down pers- passwords or elderly people not being confident on using password managers to save their passwords. And we've all been there when you want to quickly save a password, you write it down or you might copy, but that's not always the safest thing to do. Um, do you have any advice on about either password managers you'd recommend or how to access information about them? Again, I think the Friends Against Scams team will have things around um, the password managers, but um, most smartphones, if you use a smartphone now, have a a password like authentication um, process kind of built into them, software built into them, and they will auto generate a password for you and you can save that directly. So then if you log on to, say, your bank or say a a website that you use frequently, Mm. it will automatically input your password. And often that password is 16 characters, a mix of symbols, capitalization, lots of different things. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very similar. I, I really struggle to remember passwords. I'm constantly having to click that forgot password button <laughs> and then get my my um, you know resetting my password. And it's it's very common practice actually for us to write our passwords down. I think we we sign up to so many things. It's it's uh, kind of almost a standard practice, and it's very difficult for us to kind of a habit for us to break. And particularly with our older beneficiaries, it's very difficult for them to remember. If you you know if you've got passwords for say twenty different things, remembering twenty different passwords is difficult. And you are going to use you know your pet's name or your spouse's name or you know yeah. something along those lines. Of, you know your childhood a childhood memory. Um, but it's just is I think what part of my advice is if you can use the password um, kind of generators do because they are a really good way um, of keeping you protected against scams and fraud but if you haven't got the the abilities or the software to do that um, I think you can still use things that are familiar to you you, but just kind of almost like shake them up a bit so you know throw in a couple of random letters or numbers or a bit of punctuation so it's very difficult to kind of hack and guess 
Um, I can't recommend platforms because I don't know enough about them, so I'm not going to talk about that because um, um, I won't want to give people misinformation. But um, that would be my kind of advice on, in regards to password authentication. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I can see there's two people with their hands up. Thank you so much for waiting. Um, I'm going to let them, I'm going to ask them to unmute and then they can ask their question. So, Tony Ford, um, would you be able to ask your question to Jess? I can. Um, brilliant presentation, Jess. It's given me lots of uh, lots of ideas. Um, we, we run a, a friendship hub, a neighbourhood wide friendship hub. And, and so we have tried to bring elderly people out of isolation. Um, to come and have a have a drink with us and meet with us, and we have a small digital hub. Um, we've had lots of people who've been given a phone by their family, and this is how yeah. you use, it, and then they're off, and it goes in the drawer. And we've got lots of people that we have to explain. Like a mobile phone means you carry it around with you. So we've got volunteers who are very patient who try and help them, and we give daily briefings about the the risks and things that are about. The police come in. And we do uh, presentations. I really like the idea of, of scam champions. I just wanted to mention that I've been on um, a, another Zoom meeting today, which was about digital voice, um, which is okay. taking out the, the hard phones and, and getting people online so they have hubs in their home. And I had lots of concerns about that, which have been answered today. But one thing that stood out was when this happens and people are having these phones put, uh, being put in, Anybody can pretend and knock on the door and say, um, I've come to fix your phone. And so that, yeah. that is a real risk that um, I think we need to make people aware of um, that's going to be happening uh, all over the country quite soon. As well as uh, the other thing which I found out about, that um, people who, uh, who have the pendant for a risk can actually tell the people, just keep me on a hard line. I don't need to... Uh, I don't need to have um, a line like that, um, teaching people how to keep themselves safe. But uh, I'm really interested to have a look at your website and getting lots more ideas from you. So thanks very much. Yeah, no, thank you, Tony. That's that's really lovely. It'd be great also to connect with you perhaps offline and learn more about what, what you do in terms of the digital the digital hub and, and the friendship hub, because uh, it sounds like there's a lot of synergy um, between what we do. So it'd be great to connect. But yeah, absolutely. I think those are the kind of two key concerns. Um, we have we have started to see, interestingly, a trend in um, people who have been accessing our services um, more recently who are users of smartphones um, and who do want us to contact and connect with them online, which is really interesting. And so we do predict that this this um, this kind of theme, not around scams and fraud, but online and connectivity will start to change over the forthcoming you know, months and years um, as our older population ages, but also our older population and generations change. Um, so, so we do expect to see that, but um, yeah, absolutely we, we many of our older people we still contact via landline um and even when we they have been referred to our service um we'll often do an onboarding call with them so we'll call them to say you've been referred by this person and they've referred you to this service are you happy to come speak to us um and again it can be very difficult for us to you know establish that initial contact with them because um they don't know who we are um, and, you know, we're, we're contacting essentially out of the blue. So there are those challenges that we do have. Um, but again, in, yeah, in relation to kind of installing of landlines, absolutely, it is a risk. Um, and I think, you know, um, sharing the resources from the scams champion and scams marshals would be really useful because they do have some great tips on kind of what to look out for if people kind of knock on your door. Um, so, yeah, but please do feel free to reach out to me if you want to connect. Yeah, the, the only other thing I, I would add... Um... While I'm thinking about it, the next door lady next door has just knocked on my door because she's just received um, something from the borough council saying she's got to pay for her brown bin, but it's got to be paid for online, and she hasn't got them online. So only our local parish council once a year now put a newsletter through the door. The borough council and the county council don't put anything through the door. People have to find out what's going on and what's available online. So they're yeah. being excluded. Yeah in more than yeah. just digitally, they're being totally excluded from everything that's happening in the community. Yeah, absolutely. And we find that and a lot of a lot of things are moving to online, you know, post offices, banks, everything. My gran, I, I liken this because my gran is in her 90s. Um, and we I went through this with her only a few weeks ago and she needed to sort something out with her banking. Um, and she's hard of hearing and everything and everything was you need to go online and you need to do this. And she said, I don't use the Internet. 
I don't have a you know a laptop I don't I don't have um, an email address and it's getting much much harder I think um, mm. for people to be able to connect but also to kind of think keep connected with society in a lot of ways and um, I, you're probably aware but I know Age UK have been doing a big campaign around the importance of offline and online connection um, and I do recommend checking that out they, they're kind of I think they're now at the parliamentary stage with it but um, it's yeah, def- certainly worth checking out um, really interesting campaign and very relevant to this day and age. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Tony. And thank you, Jess, for that. Tony, thanks so much for your questions. That was really good. And for your sharing advice. Um, we have another hand up, uh, just one more, from um, Jill Bonney. Jill, would you like to share your question? Hi, thanks very much. Um, I've mentioned in the chat, um, I, I actually am a banker um, and I, I work in the field of fraud prevention. Um, and I can certainly say that everybody, without exception in my team, is passionate about stopping fraud and scams. It's, it is literally what we do all day, every day. Um, so I just wanted to pick up on the, the topic of if you've been scammed or you've, you've been a victim of fraud, please tell your bank as soon as you can. Because the ideal scenario for us is we'd like to get your money back to you. And if we can get the money back to you, it means the criminal hasn't got it. Um, And that's a big deal in itself, because the money that is generated from fraud isn't just somebody going on a big spending spree. It funds organised crime. It funds human slavery, human trafficking. It's it's a nasty, nasty business. Um, So please tell us as soon as possible. That gives us the best chance of getting your money back for you. Um, I don't want to get into um, comments about when we would refund people, because there are actually different laws and regulations about different payment schemes. So there's different rules for card payments, different rules for pay, faster payments, etc. cetera. So um, I, I don't want to go into the, the details of when you would or wouldn't be refunded, but please tell us as soon as you can, because that gives us the best chance of getting you right as soon as possible. Um, most banks will also offer restrictions on accounts. So if you don't want online banking, um, you don't have to have it. If you don't want a checkbook because you think that might be a a vulnerability, you know, maybe you've now got carers coming into your home and you think, well, I don't want a checkbook because what if someone was to steal the checkbook? Then you get get your get your checkbook cancelled and say that you don't want another one. That can all be done. Um, And finally, if you or a family member has any sort of vulnerability um, that could be being blind or or being deaf, maybe a chronic illness, um, dementia, again, Tell your bank about that so they know that you've got a vulnerability. Um, Different banks call it different things. In my particular bank, we call it a customer care flag. And that means that that little flag is available then in front of every single customer facing colleague, whether they're on the phone, whether they're in the branch. They would know instantly I'm talking to, for example, Barbara, and I now know that Barbara has got this. And so I can then then make allowances for that. So it means Barbara doesn't need to tell every person every time. So if there's something that you think your bank should know, please tell them, because believe me, we desperately want to stop the fraud. We don't just want to be fixing it afterwards. So as much help as you can give us to help you is always appreciated. Thank you, Jill. That's so informative. I think it's really I feel really reassured by knowing about when I think about my elderly relatives, knowing that you know, they are going to be listened to at banks and also that, you know, it's not just a transactional thing. Their their bank is there to care for people as well and to offer those supports with their needs around money. So that that's really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Um, Jess, I just wondered, a question had come through, and I, I know you've mentioned it before, but re-engaged, do you work across the country? And can, do you find that in different regions there's someone for everyone to talk to or to access a service? Yeah, absolutely. So we do. Yes, we operate nationwide. So um, including Scotland, <laughs> that is nationwide. Um, and yeah, um, activity groups and tea parties um, nationwide. There are um, other services, obviously, within regions and, and localities. Um, there are lots and lots of great services out there, grassroots and more kind of just regionally based services that are working with older people, but also not just older people with communities to reduce social isolation and loneliness. Um, there is uh, there are organisations like the Co- Joe Cox Foundation who do like the big summer get together um, and th- they do some fantastic work in, in that space. Um, so, yeah, there's always opportunities um, to get involved. 
I think the um, NCVO, the National Centre for Volunteering Organisation, sometimes they will um, share information um, about kind of local communities, but you can also usually find things um, on kind of council websites um, and things like that. Um, but we, yes, re-engage we do. We absolutely operate nationwide. We are really keen to establish as many activity groups and bring an end to social isolation and loneliness um, as fast as possible. So, you know, anybody who would be keen to set up or run a tea party or an activity group, anything like that, we really encourage to get in contact with us because we have a lot of older people who are waiting for our services and we need to have that balance between our older people waiting and our volunteers. And, and as we know, sadly, the number of people volunteering is diminishing kind of year on year, understandably so with the cost of living crisis and everything, but it is something we experience. So yes, if you, you know, if anything, as I said, has resonated today and you're really keen, please do reach out to me, reach out to um, my colleagues and we'd be happy to answer any questions or um, kind of get you involved in what we do. Thank you. You know, it's lovely that um, you've mentioned there um, the big help out because it's funny, we um, in Neighbourhood Watch, we celebrate the month of community neighborhood watch week big lunch big help out every year and they're so happy so positive those events and such a good opportunity for neighbors and communities to get together I think and really meet each other and also you know if you're someone who can't commit a lot of time to what you might perceive as volunteering you know even a small action can have such a big impact I think that's a, a, a great time in the year to really celebrate that and acknowledge that um, so I'm glad you've said that because that's a great uh, thing that we encourage all our supporters and members and people in the community to get involved with. Um, and I feel like the more connections you have, you are supported by your neighbours and your friends and community. Um, yeah, absolutely. We 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 also run a Christmas call companion service, which is obviously is, has now passed. We will be doing it again this year. But there is the opportunity that if you don't have the time to commit to you know, long term volunteering, you can do temporary volunteering. But what we often find is those who sign up to become a Christmas call companion often establish such a, a kind of strong bond and a relationship with their call companion that they don't want that to end when January rolls around. So then that will continue throughout the year. And, you know, the conversations can be quite deep and it's it's a mutual kind of benefit for the call companion volunteer, but also the older person. And it's again, it's, it's that thing around peer support and connectivity um, and again, reducing social isolation and loneliness. Massively. That's amazing. It's so lovely to hear that, that people carry on on their journey of volunteering beyond what they initially started. Um, I've had so many people saying thank you for this session today in the chat. And um, I really I want to say at this point, you know, it's on the screen, hopefully. We'd love to get some feedback from as many people as can who, who want to do the feedback survey. You just have to open your camera if you have a phone um, and you can hover over it and do our feedback after this session. We'll also follow up with the feedback link in our follow-up email um someone asked and just to reiterate we will share the slides that Jess kindly shared today and the recording so hopefully anyone who joined a little later can catch up next week with this um we've just got maybe I'd say two three more minutes if there's any last questions otherwise I think we can close and really take away what we've learned from today um I'll just have a quick dive into the chat I mean lots of thank yous Jess <laughs> Oh, no, well, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> oh, and actually I can see Cheryl, my colleagues, dropped the um, the link into the survey. Thank you, Cheryl. That's great. Well, I tell you what, I think let's say thank you and goodbye. And I think, you know, if people do have questions that they haven't had time to think of today, please pop myself, Cheryl or Jess. I'll put Jess's um, email back on the screen. You know, pop us a question because we're here to answer them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And it's, yeah, it's been wonderful.